Nestled in the heart of the Tennessee Valley, at the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains, in the robust rocket city of Huntsville, Alabama, lies Fellowship Presbyterian Church, a historically African-American congregation established in 1954 by the North Alabama Presbytery. Fellowship is called by God and empowered by the Holy Spirit to make disciples by reaching, growing, and sending people with Christ to do justice, to live mercy, and to walk humbly with God. Welcome. We are delighted to have you worship with us this and each Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Central, where the bread of life is spiritually broken by Reverend Gregory Jerome Bentley, the fifth pastor of Fellowship Presbyterian and co-moderator of the 224th General Assembly of PCUSA. Hebrews chapter 10, starting with verse 24. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, beloved, and welcome to Worship at the Ship on this fourth Sunday in Advent. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. Uh, The call for worship this morning is taken from the book of Psalms, the 89th division, and it reads this way. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth, I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to my servant David. I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. Selah. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the Holy Ones. Let us lift up our voices together and sing the hymn of praise this morning with joy and gladness. Three. 
receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior. Let men their songs employ, while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. No more let sin and sorrow. ground. He comes to make his blessings flow. Far as the curse is found, far as the curse is found, far as, far as the curse is found. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nation's proof the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and one and wonders of his love After severe flooding in 1920, the state of Vermont earned a nickname of Brave Little State. More recently, citizens in Vermont added a motto of Brave Little States that says no to hate. Last year, children of a school in Vermont voted to fly a Black Lives Matter flag on the flagpole. The news story unleashed a torrent of hate messages that the school's education board for allowing these and the and the many more comments about how all lives matters many americans were shocked to realize they had been living in a bubble it was time to shed light on what was really happening the pope prop Prophet Isaiah talks about people walking in darkness, but eventually they will have a light shine upon them. This light, though, is not a given. We need to do our part in order to have it shine upon us. We need to stop living in bubbles. We need to recognize the way we perpetuate hate no matter what hate it might be, we need to open our hearts, re repent, and invite the light in. It is not going to be easy because sometimes we get used to being in the dark and a sudden stream of light can be jarring. But we, like Roman, need to be brave, like little states that say no to hate. For how can we enter into the season of Christmas where love came down from the heaven and still harbor hate? As I light the candle for love, I ask, I ask everyone to eliminate hate in their hearts, hope for a better future, joyfully forgive, choose peace, and embrace love.
Psalms 146, 8, the Lord opened the eyes of the blind. The Lord raised them that are bowed down. The Lord loved the righteous. Isaiah 38, 17, behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul, and deliver it from the pit of corporation for the has cast all my sins behind my back. Let us let us pray. Heavenly Father, as Christmas Eve approaches, I know there is a lot of sadness this year. Hate and fear live in so many hearts. Holiday cheer is missing. Lord, give everyone the light of love in their hearts. Open my heart to love our brothers and sisters and for them to love me in return. Give us new ways to praise you and show the love in our hearts that you always wanted us to have. Thank you for all greatness give. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. On this holy night, mentally drop all of the burdens you are carrying at the side of the newborn's cradle. Imagine streams of light coming from heaven, surrounding you with grace. Not being able to sing silent night as we have always done in church. It's a tradition that will be missed, but we can look beyond the loss to see what new praise can be found. What new way can we join together in Christ? to celebrate Christ and his coming. We can acknowledge and face our fears and sorrow. Upon lamenting with face, we cling to hope. We center on God and his love for us to find joy that surpasses all understanding, armed with hope and joy. We pray for peace in our hearts and minds, which allow us to love. In love, we discover new friends or rediscover forgotten ones to bring a new understanding of Emmanuel, God with us. As I light the Christ candle, we cherish the flames already lit for hope, joy, peace, and love. Luke, second chapter, verses 1 through 14. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judah, to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went, to the, he went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before him, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see David, a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the hev in highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. Let us pray. God of Christmas grace, your love is breaking through the dark night of my soul with a divine light that not only illuminates hope and joy in my life, 
but also chases away my fears and gives me courage and peace once again. I couldn't have asked for a better gift ever in my life than the gift of Jesus, your son. May my Christ's light that has been rekindled shine brightly now and forever. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let us pray. Well, Lord our God, we thank you for this day that you have made and we are rejoicing and glad in it. Thank you, Lord, for gladness and the joy that you give even during these trying times, during these, uh, these exhausting times. We thank you for your spirit that infuses us with new life and vitality to keep on keeping on. We thank you for giving us a mind to gather together, to worship together, to lift our voices together in prayer and praise and proclamation of the word. Your word that is still a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Your word uh, that continues to, to give us light for the journey ahead. We thank you, Lord, that you have uh, seen fit uh, to uh, inhabit the praises of your saints this morning. We ask that you show up and show out, that you lift up bowed down heads, and that uh, you prop us up on every leaning side, uh, that we might keep on keeping on. We pray for those, Lord, who are, who are struggling, who find themselves disoriented and discombobulated, we pray that they would experience right now your peace that passes all understanding. We pray, Lord, for those who are hungry, those who are homeless. We pray for those who are friendless, those who have lost their way, those who feel like they have to throw in the towel of life. Help them to realize that you are still in the blessing business. Make us a committee of one to reach somebody that we come in contact with to share a word of hope and help that uh, they might experience you in a way that they've never experienced you before. We know you're able and we know you're willing. And we trust that you will do what only you can do as we go forward with you to bear witness to your rule and your reign. This we ask in the mighty, the matchless, the marvelous, and the magnificent name of Jesus, and for his sake, let the assembly say, Amen. All things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own have we given thee. Lord, we ask that you bless and sanctify this offering that it might be used to empower and equip these, your people, to make disciples by reaching, growing, and sending people with Christ to do justice, to live mercy, and to walk humbly with you. In the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Beloved, we thank you for 
your extravagant generosity, your consistent generos generosity in these strenuous and stressful times. We thank you uh, that you continue to trust God and continue to, to give out of what God has blessed you with to bless this ministry that we might keep on keeping on in this place, lifting up the name of Jesus and carrying out his mission of reaching, growing, and sending people with Christ to do justice, to live mercy, and to walk humbly with you. Uh, may God bless you, and may God keep you, and may you keep on keeping on. The sermonic text for today is taken from Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, beginning with verse 26, and it reads this way. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her, who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
A few years ago, the youth of my congregation spent their Sunday school hours sitting in the dark. It wasn't a power outage or some kind of punishment. One of their teachers, who's a professional photographer, had transformed one of our church offices into a camera obscura. I didn't know what a camera obscura was till I got to try it myself. It's a small room made completely dark black plastic over the windows and doors, except for one tiny pinhole over the window through which light from outside can come in. The light doesn't enter as a beam, like you might have thought it would if you'd had a flashlight in mind and had not been accompanied by friends who remembered their physics. The light comes in through innumerable straight lines that crisscross at the pinhole so light from above is projected onto the floor, and light from below is projected onto the ceiling, and the shadows that you would see outside are now inside the room, but upside down and pretty cool looking. It happens instantaneously, all the light and shadows projected that way. But you don't see much of anything until your eyes adjust to the dark. That's the great part, I think. And as we sat in the dark, waiting to see what we could, we talked about Advent and ways that the camera obscura provided a microcosm of the Advent journey. There was the interplay of darkness and light, the way certain notions can get turned on their heads, the waiting to see what has already been given, the fact that you can't rush it. You can't work any harder at it. That was my favorite part, the need to wait without effort to see and receive what was already there. So much of our lives we spend rushing around, working hard to earn and achieve things for ourselves. As early as preschool and kindergarten, we are tested and evaluated, graded, and rewarded for good behavior. As adults, our efforts are admired or dismissed, depending on what we do or fail to do at school, at work, at home, everything from job performance to holiday decor. My, you've outdone yourself. 
We take pride in what we accomplish. So much so that we sometimes have difficulty appreciating what comes to us regardless of the efforts we make. Not long ago, as part of a Sunday school class talking about justice, I watched a lecture the political philosopher Michael Sandel gave at Harvard University. Sandel was examining John Rawls' notion that the distribution of wealth and opportunities shouldn't be based on factors for which people can claim no credit, factors that are arbitrary from a moral point of view. It was fun to watch the students responding to Rawls' ideas. Many acknowledged that they had indeed benefited from things they couldn't claim to have earned. Parents with plenty of money, for instance, basic intelligence, white skin, or a good education prior to Harvard. The rub was in regard to effort. I worked my whole life to get into a school of this caliber, said one student, a young man named Mike. I earned this. All right, said Sandal, you think that when people work hard to get ahead and succeed, that they deserve the rewards that go with that effort, right? Yes, that's exactly what Mike thought. Sandal said, you know what Rawls' answer to that is? Even the effort that some people expend depends a lot on fortunate family circumstances for which we can claim no credit. Never mind economic class, said Sandal. Those differences are significant, but put those aside. Psychologists say that birth order makes a lot of difference in work ethic, striving, effort. How many here are first in birth order? Sandal asked his students. Mike was among the clear majority of students who raised their hands. Is it your doing that you were first in birth order? Sandal asked. Mike shook his head, disgusted. We prefer the feeling of achievement. It's why many of us spent the last moment comparing our work ethic to that of our siblings, am I right? Save it for later if you can. We prefer the feeling of achievement. Like King David does, as we hear about him in the story the lectionary suggests for today from 2 Samuel. The situation there is set up beautifully. My friend Kim Clayton says, you can just see David settled in on his sofa with the overstuffed pillows, feet up on the ottoman, looking out his big picture window at the land he rules as far as the eye can see. The momentum for David is up. He must feel like he is on his way. David has put the Philistines in their place. He has consolidated the country, impressively uniting North and South. He has established the new capital city, Jerusalem, and brought up the Ark of the Covenant in a grand and festive parade. Goliath is dead, Saul is dead, and David is alive, very much alive, riding a crest of popular acclaim and gratitude. Now, the scriptures say, when King David was settled in his house, his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him. The king said to the prophet Nathan, see now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. About this moment, Eugene Peterson says, do you know what I think? I think that David is just about to cross over a line from being full of God to being full of himself. Heady, with all of his success, the king believes he is now going to do God a favor. See, I am living in a house of cedar. David believes he is housed better than God, that he has achieved a standard of living better than that of God. He believes that from his current position of strength, he now can do something significant for God. David is about to cross the line from being full of God to being full of himself. 
the prophet Nathan conveys a message that pulls David back from that line. Nathan reminds David that the sovereign God will not be bought or held in place. God is free and will continue to be. Nathan reviews for David the long history of God's gracious acts. What got David where he is today? I took you from the pasture, God says, to be prince over my people, Israel. I have been with you wherever you went. I cut off your enemies from before you. I will make for you a famous name. I will pick the place, plant the people, and give you rest and peace. King David will not build a house for God. God will build a house for David. Just to be clear, this is not something for which David will claim credit. God pro God's promises culminate in a decisive new pledge. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me, God tells David. Your throne shall be established forever. Do you know what this means? Not only can David not earn the prosperity of his kingdom, because prosperity is God's gift to the people, but also David cannot mess it up. This promise of God is unconditional forever, forever. It's a turning point in the relationship between God and Israel. Before now, all of God's commandments, all of God's commitments had been governed by an if, as in, you shall be my treasured possession if you obey my voice and keep my covenant. But here, the if is replaced by a conjunction Walter Brueggemann renders nevertheless. David may sin. In fact, David will sin terribly. Nevertheless, God's commitment to David will persist. There will be sanctions and punishments for David and for all of Israel in response to their sin. Those sanctions and punishments will be severe sometimes, but they will not be terminal. This is, says Brueggemann, a clear and powerful articulation of justification by grace, in which the works of David and Israel are not decisive. God loves unconditionally and has promised to make things right. So the redemption and prosperity of God's people will always be thanks to God, not David. God's promise here is like the pinhole through which the light of messianic expectation begins to shine for Israel, overturning their expectations, illuminating their hopes, blessing and strengthening generations yet unborn. As we turn to Luke, we meet the heirs of this promise, along with Jesus Christ, who comes to fulfill it. In Luke, the angel appears to Mary, announcing God's favor. And I can't help but think again of the things people earn and the things they do not and cannot earn. Here Gabriel addresses Mary as the favored one or blessed one. Is this a title Mary has won, the fruit of her faithfulness? What does Gabriel's greeting mean? In the Roman Catholic Church, the angel's greeting is understood to highlight Mary's extraordinary nature. She is revered because she's one of a kind, without sin, and also a virgin mother. But in Protestant churches like my own, the extraordinary thing about Mary is precisely that she's ordinary. As the theologian Cynthia Rigby says, we believe Mary is a member of the priesthood of all believers. She exhibits for all of us sinful embodied saints the mysterious reality that we are included in the love of God and included in the work of God. Reformer John Calvin rejected the idea that when Gabriel identified Mary as favored, he meant she was worthy of praise. Rather, Calvin said, Gabriel recognized Mary as the happy one, 
who had received the undeserved love of God and recognized it. Let it be with me according to your word, Mary told the angel. Let it happen to me as you predict. The undeserved love of God, blessings we did not earn, light coming freely to us, such as also known as grace. I've been reading Donald Miller's memoir, Blue Like Jazz, and he talks about the difficulty some people have receiving the grace of God. He used to be one of those people, he said. He would hear about grace, read about grace, even sing about grace, but he couldn't accept it. It seemed wrong to me, he said, not to have to pay for my sin, not to feel guilty about it or kick myself around. More than that, grace did not seem like the thing I was looking for. It was too easy. I wanted to feel as though I had earned God's love, as though God and I were buddies doing favors for each other. Miller had his epiphany in, of all places, a grocery store. He was standing in line at the checkout, and the woman in front of him pulled out food stamps to pay for her groceries. He had never seen food stamps before. This is a privileged story, still a good story, I hope. He was intrigued about the food stamps, also uncomfortable. Miller found himself wishing there was something he could do, maybe pay for the groceries himself, but he just stood there. The woman kept her head down, walked stiffly away. She knew he was watching her, feeling sorry for her. It was later he realized it wasn't that woman who needed pity, but Miller himself. Somehow, he said, I had come to believe that because a person is in need, they're candidates for sympathy, not just charity. It wasn't that I wanted to buy her groceries. The government was already doing that. I wanted to buy her dignity. Yet, by judging her, I was the one denying her dignity. Miller began to imagine what it would be like for him to need food stamps, to buy his groceries with the currency of poverty, to feel the eyes of other customers studying his clothes and the items in his cart. Miller knew he'd want to explain he had a good job and made good money to show people he had it together, he was fine. I love to give charity, he said, but I don't want to be charity. This is why I have so much trouble with grace. Miller shared about a time he'd been praying with friends. They were listing their concerns and requests for prayer, and Miller listed a lot of his friends and family members, but never shared his own problems. A friend of his asked, what about your struggles? And Miller said, no, his problems weren't that bad. This friend said, Don, you're not above the charity of God. Then he realized his motives weren't noble, they were prideful. He didn't care more about his friends than himself. Like too many of us, he had wanted to believe he was above the grace of God. None of us is above the grace of God. All of us, from the richest and mightiest ruler to the poorest, most vulnerable mother, we are all recipients of God's charity, all of us. And while we may at times wish that we could earn God's favor, it is better, I believe, to accept that God's blessing is something given, not something won. You really can't work harder to get it, nor can you mess it up. God's love and favor simply come like light once your eyes have adjusted to the darkness of the night, or like a baby when the time for its birth has finally arrived. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and grant you peace. Amen.
Thank you. 